Um, so again, I'm very grateful to have you all here today. Um, and I know very well the road that you're on and I know it's not easy. Um, for me, it was fraught with challenges, frustration, stigma, shame, isolation, and pain. During my journey with our daughter, Chloe, I often felt helpless, hopeless, isolated, and out of control. But I want you to know today, right now, that you're not alone. Thank you for continuing to persevere with our youth, with your youth. Thank you for providing unrelenting care, support, and advocacy for your child's mental health and for yourself, even when you thought you couldn't go on. And thank you for your determination, patience, kindness, and compassion, for without you, our children would be lost. So my goal today is to pro provide you with some insight from what our family has learned with our daughter and from other families that I work with. Um, however, I'm sure most of you know, uh, the reality of youth mental illness is there is no secret sauce or recipe for success. Um, mental illness is all sorts of gray and there's no fixing a child. Uh, it's a lifelong disability that must be continuously managed. So thanks for having me today. We're going to move right into it. Um, I'm going to start with a book excerpt from my book, On the Edge, Help and Hope for Parenting Children with Mental Illness, and it's called Prisoners in Our Home. How had it come to this? We were prisoners in our own home. Our daughter, Chloe, routine, routinely exploded with foul language, tantrums, and even threats with weapons. Her younger sister had become her minion and punching bag. Alienated from neighbors and peers, Chloe had no friends, and her days consisted of sleeping until noon, eating, playing video games until the wee hours of the morning. Disabled by anxiety and depression, unable to communicate or socialize with her classmates or break down school assignments into manageable tasks, she often refused to get out of the bed, crying uncontrollably in a fetal position, saying, no, mama, please don't make me go. She attended about a third of the time, and more often than not, I had to go with her for support. Our school district did little to provide resources and help and my husband and I felt demoralized and defeated. We despaired about what Chloe's future would be. And here's Chloe, age five. She's right there on the right, and that's her younger sister, Sophia, at four. Um, and, you know, I, it seems like just yesterday um, that we were going through this angst and uh, pain. And I remember that just the anxiety and the stress that I felt all throughout my body and my head and my neck and shoulders, day in and day out from the crisis, I was so emotionally exhausted. It was like any chance I got, I'd take, take a nap. Um, the constant management of the day's crisis and shame of not being a good enough mom, not being able to help my daughter, not being accepted, not belonging to anyone who understood. It took its toll and chipped away at my confidence and self-esteem. And I remember so clearly, not only my pain, but feeling Chloe's pain, her anxiety and her depression from having no friends, from being shunned, from not being understood in school, from feeling stupid, from people telling her she wasn't listening, she wasn't trying, she didn't care, from be believing she was bad, worthless and a disappointment. But I knew early on in my gut that something was off. I struggled with bipolar, depression, and anxiety, and I could feel it in my core. And it wasn't until her first grade teacher told me that she wasn't connecting during class, that she um, had to have one-on-one -on -one instruction to be able to learn. And she recommended that Chloe get evaluated. I remember feeling so relieved and validated that I was, my gut was spot on but I also felt terrified for her and sad for all of the struggles I knew she'd face. That was the beginning of a long journey of continued shame and stigma, misdiagnosis, helplessness, despair, anger, frustration, all the things I'm sure you can relate to. So Chloe's 20 today, she lives at home with us and she works as a vet assistant for a local vet office. Um, she has a neurological disorder called nonverbal learning disorder, ADHD, anxiety, and depression. 
So I'm sure many of you healthcare or mental health professionals know of Brene Brown. Um, if you're not aware with her, of her, I encourage you all to look her up. She's an accomplished doctor of psychology, award-winning author, speaker, consultant, and all-around badass. I love her work. She spent the last decade of her career studying shame, vulnerability, courage, and connection. I'm reading one of her books called Braving the Wilderness, where she talks about what it really means to be happy and to belong to ourselves. The book has really resonated with me because I think as caregivers and parents of children who struggle, that braving the wilderness is often how it feels for us, right? Like we're alone in our journey. And Brene says, being ourselves means sometimes having to find the courage to stand alone. I'm sure that sounds familiar, that isolation and standing alone. Uh, that was probably one of my most predominant memories with Chloe as she was growing up. And it's what I hear from other families on the daily, that there's no one to talk to, no one really gets it, knows what you're going through or understands it. Um, and more often than not, people don't ask you how you're doing at all because they're scared. They're not going to know what to say when you answer. So I today want to know how you guys all are doing and how you're really feeling, what feelings are kind of popping up to the surface as you go through this conference. And uh, when you're working with your kids, your own mental health, whatever it may be, we're going to go into the participation uh, sec section right now. So. You are either on your phone with your camera or you can go to slido.com, use this QR code, or you can use a participant code 307537. And when it pops up, just do like one word at a time. You can enter, like submit it and then go back and do another word. So tell, tell me how you're feeling. When I was in the thick of it with Chloe and our struggles, I had a lot of anger and frustration and not even at Chloe, but like the deep systemic st stigma and shame we faced day in and day out. It's so palpable. I felt helpless, worthless, not good enough, despair. So we've got a few tireds and hopefuls. I love seeing the hopefuls. We had quite a few people who participated in the um, cloud survey be before the session and Hopeful is a big one, so that, that was nice to see. Overwhelmed, frustrated, tired, stretched, wanting Olive Garden. <laughs> I know, me too, with some wine, right? <laughs> Where is it? We should all be having a glass of wine. We're on Zoom. So good. Thank you for participating. Um, you know, I hope you can see that, that you're not alone in, in this journey and that... Um, there's a lot of us who are hopeful, resilient, I love that too, and uh, feeling overwhelmed and, and that's okay, you're validated today. So, all right, I'm gonna move on. Um, this next section is a roller coaster of despair and it's again an excerpt from my book. Uh, Jeff and I started to notice that Chloe's behavior seemed to be different from other children when she was three. Uh, we enrolled her in a local Montessori, Montessori school, and the teacher told us that Chloe had a hard time following instructions. She would like jump up during circle time and yell out random things. And during recess, she always retreated to the corner of the playground to play with the bunny and didn't interact with other kids. And when she did, the teacher said she didn't know how to share or get along with them. And it was a problem that would follow her through her school years. After a few months at the preschool, she started to cry hysterically when I dropped her off. She'd be clinging desperately to my leg when I was trying to get out the door, and I'd drive, drive away, an emotional wreck, crying all the way to work, just wondering what Jeff and I were doing wrong. Feeling like we couldn't continue to leave her there, emotionally distraught, my husband and I finally decided to pull her out of the preschool during a winter break. And though we felt the right, it was the right decision in our gut, society was telling us that we had failed as parents because we had given in to our four-year-old daughter. As she got older, Chloe's tantrums continued and intensified, and we didn't understand her needs or how to handle her unimaginable mood swings and rages. The old school parenting that we grew up with 
didn't work with Chloe. It actually made things worse. And we were always on the brink of crisis, felt helpless. When Chloe was six, we were referred to psychiatrists who diagnosed her with bipolar and ADHD. He prescribed medication to help stabilize Chloe's moods and to temper her rages. And while it helped off and on, it still seemed like we were on this constant roller coaster. After a few years, we switched doctors and the roller coaster of medications and her moods <laughs> continued. Desperate, we eventually took Chloe to Portland, which is about five hours north of our home in Southern Oregon, um, for a third and fourth opinion by a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Super discouraging to us, the psychologist said that Chloe was healthy and that we, were, as parents, were making things up, uh, issues up that she didn't have, but the psychiatrist diagnosed Chloe with Asperger's. Um, and while, that psychiatrist from Portland recommended some specific treatments. Her current doctor that we had at the time in Southern Oregon disagreed with the new diagnosis and said, oh no, she definitely is bipolar. And again, although we didn't feel it was right in our gut, that diagnosis, like that something was off with that, how can we argue with our doctor, right? We felt defeated and frustrated and didn't learn until much later that Asperger's is often misdiagnosed in girls. Also, her disorder, nonverbal learning disorder, uh, is considered on the autism spectrum and has some similar characteristic, characteristics as Asperger's. So here's Chloe at age 10. That's when we took her up to um, Portland, Oregon to get her a second and third evaluation. And at this point, my mental health was in crisis. I had stopped working full time as a marketing director at a bank and started my own marketing consulting company, but worked very minimal hours so I could attend to Chloe's needs and her school struggles. I was hyper anxious, agitated, depressed, and I began to internalize and take on the burden of her struggles and failures of missing school, difficulty socializing with peers, her challenging behavior, and I felt like our public school district wasn't helpful at all. They gave her minimal supports and accommodations, even though she was diagnosed by a psychiatrist and was placed on an IEP. We felt so desperate, I started to dig deeper to see if there were local resources. And I found a, a day treatment center that, um, well, it's a school, it was a day treatment school center that was near our town, small sizes and mental health support. After I contacted the director, his first question to me is, uh, was, is Chloe on Medicaid? And I said, no, we're privately insured. And he said, oh, well, your school district won't refer her to the program then because it's only offered to children on Medicaid. Desperate for any help and support, we offered to pay the day treatment school 4,000 a month out of pocket. While the director initially agreed, he later called back saying that they wouldn't be able to accept Chloe due to a conflict of interest with our public school. As I'm sure many of you can guess, our school district had a large annual contract with that mental health agency, which only served Medicaid students, not privately insured. So if the day treatment program accepted private payment from a privately insured student, our school district would be in violation of the Oregon state law, which mandates educational accommodations for mentally disabled. So all of these experiences are laced with shame. And I know that you all know all the shame that's associated with mental illness and, and what you do. And it's not just one event or one or two people. Uh, it's on the daily, right? For us, it was years and years of being told that we weren't parenting Chloe right. Even though we have another daughter who's academically gifted and athletic. The shame was not getting to, invited to parties or not going at all to avoid a, bl a blow up or embarrassment. It was telling us to give up hope. Doctors get telling us to give up hope on the possibility that Chloe might ever lead a productive, happy life. It was having appropriate educational accommodations withheld, even though progress wasn't being made. Quarter after quarter, year after year, leaving us feeling like they wanted Chloe to fail. They wanted us to fail. 
It was being denied payment by our insurance carrier for the intensive treatment that saved our daughter's life, that saved our lives, ultimately costing our family more than $300,000 out of pocket. Ms. Shane was being asked, will she ever grow out of it? Will she have to take medication forever? Will she be fixed? Or hearing, oh, my kids throw fits too. Everyone has problems with their kids, or I would never stand for that type of behavior. While what they didn't see at home was that we were in constant crisis day in and day out. They didn't see Chloe abusing her sister or me, knocking holes in walls, destroying the house from one end to the other, breaking TVs, throwing objects, or pulling knives on families or neighbors. So let's dig in a little bit more to shame, shall we? Because I truly believe that shame is the reason it is so hard for us to advocate for our children and for ourselves, right? It makes you feel bare and like you don't belong anywhere. It magnifies that sense of isolation that we're feeling. And again, Brene Brown, our friend, she spent her career studying shame, connection, and courage. And this is what she has to say about shame. Shame is the warm feeling that washes over us, making us feel small, flawed, and never good enough. When we experience shame, we feel disconnected and desperate for worthiness. Sound familiar? Think about your own shame triggers when it comes to your child, when it comes to your mental health, when it comes to the work that you do. What are they? For me, it's definitely, I'm not good enough mom, I'm not a good enough mom, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not smart enough, I don't know enough. For Chloe, I don't belong, I'm not okay, I'm not worthy of friends, I'm bad, I'm a disappointment. Now it's your turn. <laughs> so I wanna hear from you, you're gonna use that QR code with your phone, or go to slido.com, uh, type in the number 307-537, uh, just use one word when you type stuff in and the word cloud will come in um, and share, share with everyone what your shame triggers are. No one is exempt from shame. There we go. An educated pride. making a mistake, right? That perfectionism, expressing feelings at all, right? <laughs> Being discounted, criticized. Not heard, guilt, imposture. financial consequences, mistakes, right? That perfectionism just follows us around, doesn't it? And how do we get into a society with everything that's so much about perfectionism? So thank you for sharing. I hope that you're seeing that uh, we do have shared experiences and that we all are not alone on this journey. Um, I do want to share one of the many important tools that I have learned about shame along the way in the last um, 10 years, especially, is that the more we speak about it, the less power it has over us. And I know it is super hard and scary at first, but the more you lean into it, the more courage you have, and the more that you actually learn about yourself, love yourself, your happiness, and your passion. Um, I think back particularly to when Chloe, we took her, she's gone to treatment twice. And the first time we took her, she was 13. Um, and we had just dropped her and it was like miserable. Um, and I was at the hotel with my daughter, uh, other daughter, Sophia. And I'm like, just pissed off, right? Like, why, why are we, we the only ones going through this? Everybody thinks we have this perfect life. And we don't, and like all this crap is happening that has led her to be into treatment because the schools didn't give us accommodations, yada, yada. Like, you know, I was just angry about it. So I said, I'm gonna start a blog. And before the Lemonade Project, it was called Bipolar Lemonade because we thought that's what Chloe had was bipolar. So I started a blog. I did my first blog that we had just dropped Chloe off at treatment. Um, and 
I go to Facebook to share it and I press share and like my stomach just lurched up into my throat, right? Like, and I almost barfed because it was like, oh shit, what did I do? Right? Like all these people are going to know who I am and who our family is and that we have this mental illness and, you know, like what losers we are, whatever it may be. Um, but what happened was exactly opposite. Like people came out of the woodwork. They were like, thank you so much for sharing. Um, you know, I wish more people would talk about what's going on in their lives with mental illness, et cetera. I've got, you know, a family member or a friend or whoever that's dealing with it. So thank you for sharing. So um, that was really eye-opening to me. And then again, when I published my book, same kind of thing. Okay, now I have to do interviews. So these aren't just people that I know and are friends. Like I'm telling thousands of people about mental illness in our home. And, you know, I would be shaking before my knees were shaking and going nuts. And, um, but the more I did the interviews, the more feedback I got from people that um, they appreciated the sharing and trying to normalize mental illness. So kind of goes back to Brene Brown's Braving the Wilderness, that we often have to brave it on our own and listen to our gut and speak to our shame in order to find the best answer for ourselves. In our families. So look at those shame triggers, inadequacy, mis inadequacy, mistakes, and failure. Oops. All right, so uh, this next part of our story is called Treatment Round One and Two. It's from my blog at thelemonadeproject.com. At the end of Chloe's sixth grade year, I had sh shared my story uh, with a colleague, and she told me about an al alternative charter school that her grandson attended. I immediately called the school, and Chloe was placed on the list to start in seventh grade. Though she was reluctant and anxious about starting at a new school, I was relieved and thankful that her school understood her special needs, and they worked with her to maximize her learning capabilities. For the first time ever, Chloe actually liked school. It was a huge accomplishment. She was still guarded with other children, but by the end of her seventh grade year, she trusted the school and kids enough that she started inviting them over to our house. However, the new school wasn't enough to change her warped perception of life and the dysfunctional behaviors that she had used over the years to survive. She was still skipping school about half the time and she was still ruling our household. After visiting a residential treatment center four hours north of our Southern Oregon home, my husband and I decided to send Chloe there. She was 13. It was one of the most difficult decisions that my husband and I ever made and we questioned it over and over again. The treatment center had a bed on the same weekend that Chloe and I were supposed to go down and see my nephew graduate um, from high school in California. So we used that California trip as a ruse. And instead of heading south down to California, we headed it up north to this treatment center. Chloe slept most of the drive. And as we neared the treatment center, she woke up. She didn't notice our location. She probably wasn't old enough to, and was happy as a clam, coloring and watching a movie to pass time. When we got there and she started to comprehend what was ha happening, it was awful. I felt guilty that I had totally betrayed her. The one person she trusted and relied upon the most was locking her up and leaving her with strangers. I was glad I had my mom with me because I was a blithering mess getting back to Southern Oregon. We transferred Chloe to another treatment facility closer to home about a month later. She made good amount of progress and was sent home in time to start her eighth grade year. The first year after treatment, Chloe was actually super successful. She attended school near, nearly 100% of the time, was taking responsibility for herself, helped with chores, followed our rules and a schedule, and she seemed pretty happy about herself. Even her teachers remarked about the change. When ninth grade came along, Chloe continued to make strides in her academics, but she started to socialize with friends that were neither stable or healthy. By January of her freshman year, Chloe had been set up for a fight with a friend, which rocked her and knocked her off her path. By the end of January, she had dropped out of school altogether and had taken up some risky behaviors with kids we didn't approve of, doing drugs, doing drugs in our house, a drug dealer in our house, 
Um, and she said in a social media post, quote, I'm always put down and I'm never, ever happy with myself. I always find a way to F something important up and I don't know how to stop it. I just want to have a nice life, but I can't because I'm mentally challenged. I didn't even ask to be mentally challenged. I was born with it. I'm literally so close to ending my life, you don't understand. Yeah, I look happy on the outside, but on the inside, I'm just a disaster and disappointment. After a second time of Chloe getting jumped and beat up, Jeff and I realized we needed to intervene again. And our therapist warned us if we didn't, she might face a future of probable drug addiction, legal problems, or worse, death. We hired a third party agency to help us find the right treatment facility for Chloe, which ended up being a therapeutic boarding school in Utah near Salt Lake City. There's a picture of Chloe when she was 15. You can, that was right before we sent her, just like a month. You can see that body language of her crossing her arms and wanting to give me the bird right there. <laughs> Um, getting her to this program in Salt Lake City or, or south of it was literally a nightmare. We knew that she wasn't going to go voluntarily, so we hired a transport company, uh, which sent two intervention specialists to our house at three in the morning to take Chloe to the Utah program. I remember it like it was yesterday. We gave them her backpack and headed down to her bedroom, and my knees and hands were shaking my heart was pounding as I turned on the lights and introduced her to the two escorts that would take her to her new school. She said, Mom, I don't want to go. I said, I know. And then the specialist instructed Jeff and me to say our goodbyes and leave the house. We drove to his parents' home who were on vacation and sat on their, on their bed crying. The first year at her school was a struggle, but we knew in our gut it was the right place for her. After a lot of advocacy with the program director, we switched to a therapist who was a better fit for Chloe and our family, and she eventually just started thriving and loved the program. She graduated high school in December 2018. It literally was a dream we never thought would come to fruition. So this is picture of Chloe on the horse there uh, on the left, and then our family um, Chloe gradu graduation that day from both school and her program. Um, and I feel, you know, super grateful for having the opportunity to have a family that has the resources to send Chloe to an extensive treatment center like this. Um, and I feel like it's like my mission after I came back and finished my book and I started the Lemonade Project to share with others tools and information that I learned um, that, you know, that I need to give that gift on and pass it on to other people. So one of the first things I did when I started to do presentations is I asked my parent friends at the treatment center that uh, we went to in Utah, what would you say to other parents and professionals about the experience that you've got, you know, that you've gone through? What advice would you give? And here's what they said. Listen to your gut. If you feel like something's off, it probably is. So get your child evaluated or make a change. Be brave, go outside your comfort zone. Think outside of the box. Ask teachers and others what they think about your child. Don't get stuck on a diagnosis just to check the box. Diagnoses are not black and white and are a spectrum and can look different on different kids, which can be really hard to hear and frustrating. Your kid needs to connect with the professional they're working with. If they're not, if progress is not being made, try to switch to someone else. You can waste a lot of time getting nowhere. You will know when your child is making progress. It's like when we went to the treatment, um, facility in Utah, even though we weren't with the right therapist for us, like, you know, again, I just listened to my gut and advocated like hell to get our therapist changed. Um, I knew that the, the school and the program was the right thing for her. So you will know when you're making, when their child is making progress. 
And while there is some help and hope, you're never going to fix your child or make them normal. It's all about managing their shortcomings and accepting them for who they are. Manage your expectations. Don't set yourself or your child up for failures. Take small steps and celebrate successes. These next few slides I call the $300,000 takeaways um, that I want to pass in that we got from our treatment facility. That first one, don't compromise fa family values. Always lean into those values and, and you know, identifying what they are, whether they're honesty or loyalty or compassion or caring or loving, whatever it may be, identify three to five and, and hold true to them with your children and your family. Use empathy and CPS, collaborative proactive solutions to communicate, lead with questions that are open-ended that they can answer. So, um, and I'm sure again, a lot of you are familiar with collaborative proactive solutions, Dr. Ross Green, Lives in the Balance. If you're not, check out his work. He's got some great um, ways of communicating with kids who struggle. Keep communication open, maintain boundaries, and stay the course and consi keep consistent. The other thing they gave us at um, Chloe's Treatment Center is this, it was this little laminated card and I actually still keep it in my purse today to kind of remind me when I feel like I, I need the reminder not only about Chloe, but maybe other people in my life as well. And it was called Bless. So again, those boundaries, um, letting go. So you as a parent letting go, some, you know, sometimes not trying to always fix it and hold on so tight. Practicing empathetic listening. Sit with emotion. This one is one that was hard for me to do um, oftentimes as a caregiver with kids who struggle like this. You're wanting to fix everything and you're so, you know, tied up and bound up in all of their worries and all the things that they don't learn how to sit with their own emotions and then the next one solve their own problems. So that was something that was um, a big transition for us. Embrace growth opportunities and then be deliberate with word and deed. May, meaning, I would say, you know, the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid, right? Or keep it simple, simple. Um, where a lot of these kids, again, have processing issues or sensory issues. And so trying to keep your message really brief um, and succinct and one or two words clear instead of like rattling off, you know, in anger. 18 sentences at them that they're not able to take in and process. Andrea's takeaway, um, allow yourself permission to be angry, scared, discouraged, proud, confused, tired, fed up, and trapped. Forgive yourself for not knowing the answers, for not being able to take away their pain, for being different for making wrong decisions, for being angry, for not understanding. Don't feel guilty for setting boundaries and taking care of yourself. Allow yourself to say no. You'll be much more effective and happy if you can. Give yourself some grace. Know that you are crushing it. Find your tribe who get it and lean on them. And you know what? It may only be one person that you find. And maybe through a Facebook group or someone else in town or you know, at this conference that you meet, let go of the, the fact that, or the idea, I guess, notion that um, your regular friend group that you have can't get it and isn't gonna get it. And that anger sometimes that you can hold on to around that. They're not going to. People who have not experienced this are not going to get it. Let Give them grace, love them for who they are, have superficial conversations with them, and move on with those who are your tribe. Know that your youth is absorbing more than you know or believe. This was something that was kind of has been interesting to me as Chloe. So she came home three years ago. And as she's used her, her skills and also matured and got older, I'm like um, just pleasantly surprised and so proud of her of 
um, how much she really sticks to our family values and how that comes in with, you know, just decisions that she's making. Um, where I thought, you know, five years ago, I'm like, oh my God, for crying out loud, like what does it, what's this kid going to be like, right? When they're an adult. So know that they are um, absorbing more than you think. Try to let go of your shit and negativity, right? You and your kid get a lot of it already. Let it go. And then find gratitude in life every day. It does wonders to frame perspective and try to seek un to understand everyone and their perspective. Before um, we do q and I wanted to share a few other resources um, that you could take a look at and consider for yourself, other parents. Uh, my book, of course, On the Edge, um, is available on Amazon, Audible, Kindle, and also on thelemonadeproject.com. Uh, this spring, winter, spring 2022, um, we'll be publishing a companion workbook and it offers, it's like just basically a guide to on the edge book and we'll have worksheets in there to help parents um, process their journey, um, you know, everything from what to pack, whoops, what to pack when you're going to the doctor. Oops, someone's got their, someone's got their speaker on. Okay. Um, and um, to preparing for, you know, school meetings and all, all of that type of stuff. As well as the LemonadeProject.com, there are printable resources there on the website under support. Um, and there's, if you're a teacher, a mental health professional, um, you're able to print these out. They're eight and a half by 11. You can put them up in your office or in your, um, you know, school room, whatever it may be. Um, and it talks about just everything from suicide prevention to how to talk to kids, um, to resources for crisis and, you know, behaviors that are okay and not, not okay. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, a program called Champions of Change that we just started about a year and a half ago through the Lemonade Project. And it's really um, about engaging youth in, and facilitating conversations with teens and youth of mental illness and you know why anxiety and depression is on the rise, right? As I'm 51 and I didn't grow up with a phone in my hand or a screen in my face, right? I had a telephone that had that wiggly <laughs> cord at the end that I stretched around the corner so that I could talk to my friend in private or try to. These kids have got that in their face bombarded 24 seven and it's not gonna change, right? So the reality is how do we help kids adjust and why as adults are we trying to create that for them. Let's let, so Champions of Change is about letting our youth and teenagers define what those solutions are for themselves. Um, so when I go into, I'm just going to take you through kind of the program when I present it to a school district, for example, this is kind of what it looks like. And um, so I say to them, we've got a problem, right? Suicide is a leading cause of death among young people ages 10 to 24. In Oregon, it is the leading cause of death, the one or number one cause of death. And research shows, as I'm sure all of you know, that teen anxiety and depression have increased significantly over the past decade. So I go in and I tell the school districts or administrators that, that this program, we want to measure and analyze the challenges, top challenges of teens today, um, have them help us identify primary contributors of those challenges, have them identify solutions to help mitigate it, and have them develop programs and actions that align with those solutions. So for that first objective, measure top challenges, uh, this was with North Medford High School in Oregon, a survey instrument that they developed and put out to their school, um, asking what are the top challenges? And I always know what the answer is gonna be just because I know and I've been doing this for a long time, but it's always good to come at it as, you know, what are the top challenges instead of, um, you know, mental health is an issue because 
a lot of times schools will be like, it's not a problem here. Um, anyway, so you see mental health, depression, drug, alcohol, suicide, bullying is right on top there. So we go back and then we say to the kids who were, you know, part of doing the survey in, in the class, it's usually like a leadership class, so maybe a little bit higher level is what in the beginning now that I've been working with. Um, but we say to them, what do you feel like the top contributors are to increased teen suicide, anxiety, and depression? And for this high school, Cascade Christian High School, um, here in Southern Oregon, their three were, we don't understand mental illness and don't have the tools to navigate it. The pressure and expectations to be perfect by parents, teachers, peers, and social media is overwhelming. And feelings of anxiety and depression are minimized and shamed. And I will tell you, going through this process, I've probably done it seven times now, seven or eight times now with groups of kids, is so cathartic to them. They are like, at first, they're kind of like shy. By the time they get going, it is like verbal diarrhea. Like they are, I want to talk about this information. They need it and we're not providing that, that platform. And then third, they help identify solutions to mitigate the challenges. So Cascade Christian High School, they were saying that the education through the school curriculum needs to include mental health. So this is a private Christian school. They said in health, nothing's even said about mental health, right? They talk about everything else, but not mental health. And then create outlets to connect and support. And connect was a huge word that we came up with with these kids. Empower perspective, create change in mental health comments and reactions, and then ad address the learn for them to learn how to address deeper issues and not make a superficial comment. So, you know, like, oh, God, I'm just feeling so fat today. Like, instead of, oh, you, you look great, you're gorgeous, you're skinny, whatever it is, being more, digging a little bit deeper. Are you doing okay? Is there something else going on? So kids learning how to do that. And then Cascade Christian High School developed a few peer-to-peer um, -peer activities. Um, first, they post messages of inspiration around school on social media and classrooms. So we took one of our session days to just write down different uh, inspiration, me inspiration messages. The other thing we tied this to is the um, run in Southern Oregon called Run With Grace, which is in memory of my um, friend's daughter who hung herself um, in her backyard when she was 15. And so we take these messages, kind of inspiration messages of hope, and we print them on um, signs that we place all around the course. So we tie it to that event as well. Um, and then actively practice random acts of kindness for a day or week. Um, create Cascade Christian, they created and executed a connection event at the very end of the school year. And then they also developed some connection opportunities during the summer that were led by like, you know, their student leaders. And then showing the benefit of outcomes and outcomes to teachers or administrators, um, you know, obviously increases awareness of teen challenges teaches development of survey instruments and analysis, allows a safe forum to discuss teen challenges and develop solutions, which is my number one <laughs> reason for doing this, but oftentimes you have to give more to administrators. Um, pro problem solving is heightened through activity development and execution, and teens create ownership of solutions and social issues. So here's, here's Cascade Christian in the spring at their event that they did. Um, and I tie it into, I get sponsors for it to pay for like the t-shirts, the swag they give away, all the good things. So information on that is actually um, on my website, thelemonadeproject.com. If you're interested or contact me, I would love to get this program going in other communities. Um, it has been slow to start here. So want to finish out today before we do Q&A about um, what you're grateful for. We talked about gratitude. Uh, again, if you want to share with me at slido.com or use this QR code. Um, and I, of course, today I'm so grateful for uh, having you all with me. I hope that um, I've been able to share some information that's useful. Um, and 
Uh, at the end here, we're going to be doing uh, Q and A, and I think Dominic is. If you're going, if you can do your questions in the chat, Dominic will um, help facilitate that. Dominic, there you are. So Andrea, we, can, we had a, yeah. We had a question from Beverly a little bit earlier. Are there many approved private schools? for treating youth with special needs. Now she has in SC, so I don't know if that's South Carolina or I guess it could be Southern California. So maybe Beverly could clear that up. Um, I, I, there are private schools. I mean, my, the, the struggle with, you know, all of this is that they're incredibly expensive. Again, we paid 300,000 for Chloe's, you know, therapeutic boarding school only because my parents and Jeff's parents were able to help us out with it, but there aren't many people who can. I would suggest utilizing a third party agency that helps find a therapeutic boarding school or residential treatment center, which is what we did the second time. You have to pay for it. Um, However, the placement was spot on for Chloe, spot on. They end up, you know, look, they looked at all her medical records, her school records. They talked with her teachers, her grandparents, us, you know, her friends or one friend that she had and um, like a nanny that we had that helped. So they have like a really good perspective of who she was. And they kind of knew her going in that she really was more on the autism spectrum and wasn't able to communicate, didn't have the skills to communicate. So when we got her there, it was, I, we just knew, you know, so sometimes people can put their kids in treatment that they find themselves um, and it may not be as successful. Sometimes, sometimes it is, it's fine. Did that answer your question? So I utilize, I would say utilize a third party to help. Yeah. And it was South Carolina. She was okay. Yeah, there and yes, I have someone from South Carolina just recently send their daughter to uh, a wilderness program. I just talked to him two weeks ago. I don't know if there are other questions. I'm just rechecking the earlier chats. Um, so if I missed one, just just put it in again. Um, there's one from Will Hayden. Andrea, if you're comfortable sharing, what residential treatment facility did you choose? Um, we, we went to um, Maple Lake, which was in outside of Provo, Utah. Um, and they, they really specialize in kids who kind of are on autism spectrum or have um, nonverbal learning disorder. Um, they had... A couple kiddos who, you know, had um, more like bipolar and such that they had when Chloe was there. And I think they were moving away from that. But that's, again, why it's so important to utilize someone to help find the right facility. And they had a girls program and a boys program. It was amazing. Like, I can't say enough good things. And I saw someone, someone said they saved me $100,000 to petition with my company. We hired an attorney. We spent probably close to $40,000 on attorney fees and advocacy fees trying to get our insurance company to pay for it. In Oregon, it's horrible here. So um, I'm happy that uh, someone was able to get save some money and get some money back because it's incredibly frustrating. I mean, you see, you see the issues, right? I mean, it just, we're, we're, uh, criminalizing people from the time that if they have issues from the time that they're young and they get help when they go to jail. I mean, that's kind of what my perspective is a lot. Anything else? Anybody want to say anything? <laughs> or share? I'm gonna, well, I'll just do the, so again, going to the lemonadeproject.com is where you can find all the things. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing 
And um, if you anybody wants to speak up or ask questions or have conversations, we've got we've got eight or nine more minutes. I'm open to it. I'm curious. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious. Go ahead. I have someone say something. Go ahead. I'm curious. You start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm curious to know how your daughter feels now, now that she's older, about having been taken, you know, the way that you had to get her uh, to the treatment facility. Um, you know, I, I she was super angry with us for um, a while about it, and and probably more hurt than she was angry, um, but angry too. Um, she she loved Maple Lake, so for her, she realizes that it was something that was totally needed and needed to happen. Um, Honestly, though, just truth be told, and I think this happens a lot, she doesn't remember like the first two weeks of that whole situation because of the trauma. So she just totally almost has blocked out being taken to um, the residential center in the middle of the night. So, but she does now, I mean, she absolutely, she, she wants to go back. She would go back and live there in a heartbeat if, if she had a job or something supporting her. So she really recognized the value of it. Renee, I see your hand, Renee. Yeah, thank you. I think it was Jerry who was speaking and that it was my question. She read my mind. Um, now, how does she feel about your speaking? Like, is she about, you know, you sharing your story and her story? Um, you know, she's, um, I mean, I, we'd have to ask her, but I've had this question um, posed to her before. She's come with me before to um, events and media interviews and stuff like that. And um, she's, uh, she's okay with it. You know, she kind of feels like, yeah, I'm different and, um, but that's who I am. And um, I want to love myself for who I am. I'm not going to pretend like I'm someone that I'm not. Um, so she, uh, she's fine with it. Her only thing is like, I think for a while I had in some of my materials that she was diagnosed with bipolar, which she was initially, but then it changed. And she's like, it says I'm diagnosed with bipolar. It's not bipolar, you know, like she was all, <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I'll change it. Anyways, it's more that than just the kind of technicalities of what I'm getting wrong. <laughs> and Andrea, that kind of um, speeds into my second question, which is my last question. Um, you did mention it, there wasn't, it kind of evolved into understanding being on the spectrum, that it was a lot of social pragmatics. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because we do see a lot of children with, with these social pragmatic issues and realizing that, you know, it can play into so many things. Yeah, you know, I like, I, I don't know what it is. And again, I'm not sure if it's because of screen time or, I mean, I have all sorts of theories. I mean, the amount of kids who are on the spectrum these days is like off the charts, right? Like my mother-in-law and father-in-law were teachers and they're like, oh my God, like we never, we had like one kid our whole career who maybe had Asperger's. Um, so, um, yes, the, the social challenges, and I'm wondering if it's because of kind of social media and screen time, they don't work, learn how to do that connection with other kids, um, has, has been a problem with a lot of kiddos. Um, and I, you know, what I would suggest again is going and looking up Ross Green's information, um, on collaborative problem solving, but I also think that as, adults and educators and professionals and parents that we've got to create opportunities for kids to connect about their emotions and that it is okay. It's hard for me to talk about it. I'm 51, right? So um, a lot of times if, if I'm triggered by something, but um, I think that we have taken that it's like totally gone and the whole playing situation too that kids used to have that now they're like sitting on their bum right playing video games or doing whatever thank you Anybody hi my name is oh, go ahead i'm sorry 
My name is Mariah. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And um, I have a son who, well, all of my children have um, PTSD. So they have trauma from a six and a half year abusive relationship with their father. And then my middle child is ADHD. And I feel like this conversation was extremely helpful. This presentation was extremely helpful because I go through that a lot with, they're like, oh, he's just a normal kid. Boys will be boys. And it's just, it's normal. It's maturity. But as a mom, you know, and I saw early on, just like you saw at three, I saw around the same time. I said, no, something's a bit different. You know, like he's energetic, but it's something, you know, I can, I can see in him what was going on. And everybody until this day is like, oh, you shouldn't get him a diagnosis because then that means this and that and this. And I'm like, yes, that's why I want the diagnosis. Because yeah. then it means, that means medication if necessary. That yeah. means programs opening up um, and things like that. And then I am African-American. So in the Black community or in the African-American community, it's really looked down, down upon to have any type of diagnosis you are automatically assumed to be some sort of crazy. Um, if you get your child diagnosed and go to the, take your child to see a therapist, um, it's looked down upon, even though it, it shouldn't be. Um, right. So it, this was really helpful. I really appreciate this presentation. Thank um, you. Yeah, good. And you know what? I'm, I'm for d diagnoses too. And I know like they are not black and white, but I feel like you do. Like I was so like, don't freaking tell me there's not anything wrong with them. <laughs> I know there is, right? Like it helped validate and give me like a path at least to hold on to as to what, what we could try and where we could move, right? It was like a starting point. So I feel, I feel you there. Thank you. Andrea, I, just, I have a comment. I mean, I understand you're saying about the diagnosis. Um, my name is Chantel. I'm from Arizona. Um, I think the lack of it is when you were given your diagnosis for, for Chloe, did your psychiatrist explain these to you, what they are, what their actions are, what their actions could be that you haven't seen yet? Um, I think a lot of parents are saying, yes, your child is bipolar. You know, they're given these, the diagnosis is, yes, your child is ADHD, but they're not educating the parents who have to live with the child. And you you know, our educators, the schools are educated, but what about the parents? And I feel that me working in social services for 32 years, um, when I got my great nephew, <clears throat> I had to demand, you know, get information. And, and I still wasn't given a lot of the information that I needed. <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, and I think um, there's a challenge with kids. I mean, I've often heard a lot of times they're like, they gave Chloe a bipolar diagnosis at six years old, right? Um, so uh, I think that it's, it's super unknown um, is part of it. I, because I have bipolar and I was so in tune to what was going on with her, I was like researching like crazy. Um, I will say that my book has all of them in there with the different symptoms, treatments you can do. Um, just kind of FYI, um, you know, to not to plug my book, but to plug it. Anyways, um, but yeah, like I, I wasn't explained anything. You know, I, I did it on my own and was proactive about it. Um, and I was also very aware because myself um, in my own, you know, situation. But no, the, there was no information given. And, you know, I, I feel like our school district is miserably uneducated with mental illness and at all. I mean, they have no tools and anyways, that's, you know, I'm biased about it, but. And, and Andrea, I think it's four o'clock now, but I think we missed Jeff twice. So I don't know if he's still, I think his hand was raised and then it went down, but he still has a question. I guess anyone who wants to stay on yeah. can stay so, on. Hey, that was, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Andrea, my, as you were describing your daughter, I was I was uh, seeing my son's behaviors uh, in that picture that you painted. Our son was diagnosed when he was 22. He had a law enforcement encounter, and instead of taking him to jail, they they took him for an inpatient stay. He was diagnosed bipolar, which was kind of a relief because it explained behavior, but yeah. it really 
as parents, my wife and I didn't know what questions to ask. And we didn't find out until it was too late. Um, I regret that our son died by suicide um, five years ago. I'm on sorry. The so um, we 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 loved him as best we could, and we tried, uh, you know, to get the services that he need. But we didn't we didn't know where to turn. And you know, all of the shame things that you covered earlier were were very much present in you know in our um, in our family. And so we didn't talk about it. Um, I am now, uh, five years later, um, trying to put together a, a resource for people within my company, um, parents, you know, basically a monthly call for parents, you know, that have a child with a mental health diagnosis. And I still find, you know, I'm astonished at, at all of the things that showed up in the post and the things that showed up in your, in your presentation today. Um, the, with your own bipolar diagnosis and having lived with that, it explains a lot about how you were able to become such an advocate for your daughter. Um, my question is, how do I, how do I help people without shocking them, right? Um, because this is serious shit. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Um, I didn't realize when my son was first diagnosed that the, the sooner you get a hold of or get bipolar under control, the less likely, uh, you know, the the, the magnitude um, can can be held in check. If it's if it's not handled, then then the magnitude of the swings it grows and over time. And I didn't know things like that. I didn't know that things like um, the risk of suicide is greatest after an inpatient stay. They, they didn't tell me that. Um, so it's you know, but those aren't lessons I can share with people that are just showing up and maybe they just had a a, a meeting with their child's teacher in the school. And the teacher says, you know, I don't think you're, I think something's up with your child. You know, hearing about suicide risk and, and those kinds of things is, is not the message for them. Even so, um, I, I am motivated. It's kind of my mission now to help, help parents, you know, if I can sound the alarm and be, be the, you know, the, the warning um, for, you know, let's go warn the others. That's what I'm trying to do. And so um, I'm, I'm curious what, <laughs> what uh, how how do how do you uh, how do you help people become uh, equipped to uh, advocate and understand their child's um, you know behavior and then uh, and diagnosis without frightening them? Right. Um, so my, my first question back to you is why not give that message? Right. Like I feel like we freaking tiptoe around this stuff so much. And if they've got just sharing your story, you know, I mean, not not in a way that your kid, you know, your kids eight and they're going to commit suicide or whatever it might be or take their life by suicide. But, you know, I want to share with you a compelling story of my own. You know, my my son took his life and we didn't know what was going on and we didn't have the resources. And when they're a kid, like to me, that is so I mean, that my kind of whole journey is about youth intervention with mental illness, because it's like, we don't do it early enough, right? And so by the time they get to be an adult, as a parent, you can't do anything. So mm -hmm. I would say, be ballsy about it. That's what I've learned about it. The more that, <laughs> the more that you, again, lean into that shame, choose courage over comfort, um, the, the farther that you get, and it's not, the other thing too, like I always tell people is you, you will feel alone a lot of times and it takes a while for people to come back to you about, oh my gosh, like I heard you say that like five years ago and you know, you kind of were bitchy about it, but now I get it because I see, you know, my whatever nephew is, is got bipolar, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, like I, I was just, because I just of how I am too, I was just so pissed off about all this stuff that we went through with Chloe and what an injustice it is to kids. And I knew so many other kids were going through it and we could afford treatment, but who can, right? That's so like ridiculous. So, um, I just was, it's just part of my personality, but I just pushed through it. I mean, I'm very anxious. I have a lot of anxiety, but I just am like, you know what, if you don't like me because I'm going to talk about this, bye-bye. Yeah. I mean, you. you know what I mean? And I think, yeah, you've got to find your own way. I'm probably maybe not as tactful. <laughs> <as I'm laughs> <happy. laughs> but... yeah. Can I say thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Jeff, for for sharing. Um, I, I agree with Andrea in, in 
you know, sharing your story in whichever way you want to share it is really the way I, I feel in which you can go because um, I'm a family programs specialist and I, I have my own lived experience and I've, I've shared my story about my loved one and his challenges. And when you open up to people transparently and honestly and genuinely, it's amazing the change that you can see. And, and so many people will then speak up and go, well, I've been dealing with this and I've been dealing with that. And I didn't know it could be this. And then sharing education. I really feel, you know, people start to look, you share, okay, I have this resource here and I have this resource there. And, and you share resources and more people get connected and, you know, it changes lives. I see it every day in my job, in my work. And, and you know, and so I share with friends and families. And of course, certain cultures are not going to get it right away. I come from a culture, you know, I have an English and a Jamaican background. So with the Jamaican, there's certain things, as somebody shared earlier about African-American, you don't say, you don't talk about mental health and mental illness. I have to say that I feel since the pandemic, it's coming much more to the forefront of how serious our nation is in crisis. Uh -huh. Everybody's going through something. So this is a time that I think sharing and opening up will change lives. And, and to that point, thank you, um, is that I also believe that the more that we share ourselves, again, work through that shame, don't be, don't be afraid of it, the more people connect to you and open back up. And then you start, like, you know, you're trying to be a leader and, you know, something that you're doing with work, people will start coming to you. I mean, I have people coming to me all the time. I get referred to all the time by all mm -hmm. over the country, right? Um, by, by pair, I mean, whatever, like, I don't even know how they come to me half the time, but it's, it's, and it's like that, it's so gratifying to me, like it, and I think that's, you know, Jeff, probably what, what you will start experiencing too, is it's just like, oh my God, like there, you know, you do feel alone and there are so many, and there's all that shame and stigma, but when you share, you connect, and it's the same with kids, like in that whole champions of change, the more that they shared with each other, the closer they got and the more they connected. It was so beautiful. Yeah. The, the, the final thing that I'll say is, is that I, I often tell people that the lessons my wife and I learned were purchased at far too great a price not to do something about yes. it. And, and that's, that's what drives me. And, you know, if my life can serve even as a cautionary tale, then, then all my secrets, everybody knows all my secrets, all, so, you know, now. So, there's, there's, Mine there's no, too. Nothing I'm an to open book. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> oh, well, that's awesome. I think it's awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Before we wrap up? No, no. Okay. Well, you can always contact me uh, at uh, the lemonadeproject.com. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, uh, and thank you so much for being with me today. This has been awesome. I appreciate it.